So it's always a privilege for me to introduce our next uh, guest. You've all heard him. You've been asking for him every day this week. And uh, Brother Jim St. Clair is president of the BC Federation of Labour. And it, it, you know. The Fed now represents. The Federation now represents over 500,000 uh, public and private sector workers in more than 1,100 locals across the province. Jim began his working career in, uh, as a journalist in radio and print media. He was editor and contributor to the Crossing the Line, a uh, book about the North American Free Trade Agreement. Before being elected to the BC Federation of Labour Presidency, and that happened in 1999, Brother St. Clair spent nearly two de decades in the United Fishermen and Allied Workers Union, CAW. During his career in the fishing industry, he served as associate editor of the Fisherman's Newspaper, as well as health and safety director, staff representative, spent the last eight years as an elected leader of that uh, union, that great union. He recently announced his plans to move on. So uh, please join me in welcoming my friend, and a great friend to HEU, Brother Jim Sinclair. Hey. Oh, thank you. I uh, give truth to the fact, better late than never. So I'm apologizing for not showing up at my time slot the other day, but Unfortunately, my back decided to retire before I did. <laughs> However, it's better today, and I'm sure I'll be very relaxed giving this speech. The drugs they give you down there, you know about those. <laughs> They're pretty good. First of all, uh, you know, congratulations to Denisa, Bonnie, and Victor for being re-elected as leadership of your union. You've done a fabulous job, and it's a mandate for what you did. Thank you so much. And uh, Bonnie, uh, we have a date soon, don't we? Somewhere, you know, out there at the golf course. You're going to learn to play golf, right? Okay, you won't do that. I can't play either. We're okay. We're safe. <laughs> anyway. A ball game, maybe. A ball game would be good, yes. Well, I think it's kind of interesting that the last convention that I'm going to speak to as president is this one. I've always been, yeah, I do. I've always felt the labor movement has been my family and my home. And for that reason, the labor movement actually lives right here in my heart. And standing before you today, giving my last speech as president, I want to say your union, your leaders, your activists, and of course your members will always have a special place in my heart, as long as it keeps beating. <laughs> I have been, I have been truly inspired over the years by your incredible courage, your incredible commitment, and your fundamental belief that your job was more than just taking care of that very important part of your job, which was healthcare workers, but was standing up for all Canadians to make sure that we kept in place a public medical system for every Canadian in this country. And your union's done a great job for that. For that commitment, I thank you so much. It goes without saying that we have traveled difficult roads together, lived through attack after attack after attack. The fact that we're all in this room together is a success story in itself because there were people on this planet and in this province and in government and business that did not want us in this room today. And we are here today as a testimony to your courage and vision for your union. Thank you for doing that. And it was, of course, the first volley was Bill 29. Bill 29 that tore up your collective agreements, took out the contracting out language. And you could have given up at that point, but you didn't. In fact, you dug in. And you went to court 
and you went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and when that ruling came down, not only did you win, but every worker in Canada won the right, the constitutional right, to have a union and bargain collectively. And that was a victory for all of us. And of course, after they ripped up the contracts, they decided that they were going to contract out all the work out and rip up all the wages and lower them all down, as you all know. It was a terrible time in the labor movement. I remember getting a phone call from Chris Allnut saying, you know what they're doing, Jim? They're blacklisting HEU members. They're saying that the new employers won't hire anybody who was in the HEU. So we had a meeting and we talked about that and said, this isn't okay. And so I know the BCG went back and Janie Clark did this. She phoned back up that lawyer from the other side, asked them the same question. If we take that certification, does that mean we can't hire HEU members? And he said, yes, that's the truth. And we taped it. And we held a press conference at the Federation of Labor with all the other unions that were there and all the other unions that had been approached to sign the sweetheart deals. And we said publicly, no blacklisting of HEU members. We won't stand for it. And that was an act of solidarity by everybody. That was a high point. Then there was the low point. And that was when the IWA, which wasn't in the room the day after I phoned them, wasn't in that room and went out and signed contracts for, a, a, for former HEU workers for $10 an hour. And I will say for this, not one other single union supported that. In fact, we signed an agreement amongst all of us that if they contract out their work, the first people to organize those people will be the HEU and nobody else. And that was our actions against that plan. <laughs> and yes, you did your job too, because you could have gone away like they have in the states of many places and said, we're the public sector, we have nothing to do with those people. But actually what you did say was they're healthcare workers and they're part of our family. And you went out there and you went and you organized and organized and organized and organized and more than 5,000 or 6,000 people today have an HU card back in their pocket and they don't have an IWA card because you organized them, put them back in your union and congratulations for that one too. That was so important to us. And of course it doesn't get any easier for it, does it? Because then the government realizes, oh, once we get the HU back in there, we'll just change the law again. We'll change it so that the government can fire everybody, or the owners of the long-term care facilities can fire everybody and bring in another company. Imagine a government that agrees that that should happen. The most recent example, yes, Park Place. Seniors living over in Duncan. I was also up at the rally at their same place. They did it in Campbell River. 264 workers fired. Just like that. People who have taken care of those people and been their friends, their loved ones, for year after year after year. This is not a hospital. They're important too. This is their home. And those are the people that take care of them. And the people in charge don't give a damn. And that's the truth. And so they fired 264 people and brought in a company. And I love this. They brought in a company called Care Corp? <laughs> really? you got to be kidding me who brought in all the new workers. And of course, you did what you've done so many times. You went to your members who believed in you. And they hired some of them back, and they went other people that came in, and you reorganized them. And now you're sitting down demanding a new collective agreement. Well, that's a great thing to be done, but I want to tell you the other thing we have to do. We have to elect a government, like the one you heard about the other day that might get elected next time around, that agrees that if you're an HEU member in that facility, I don't care if they sell it to Timbuktu or Santa Claus, you're still going to be working there when that deal is over and you still have your job. Right. We're going to do that. In a way, the challenge is more profound on one level. And I want to say there's not a union in the country that has put up the fight you have to protect public health care. It's just so important. We talk a lot about solidarity in the labor movement, but to me, I feel in my guts one of the most highest acts of solidarity we have with each other is to live in a country where you get to go to the hospital and get health care without a visa card.
It's just... And we have heard for years so many things. The right wing, they want us all to have choice. You know, they've co-opted the word so much. Because after all, we all want choices. But in reality, there's Brian Day's choice. And then there's Tina Richardson's choice. Brian's choice really is that rich people get to bump ahead of the line. They can jump the queue. And better yet, pay him for the right to jump the queue. He's got it all figured out. Tina Richardson's choice is more simple. To fight for a public health care system that will save her child's life. Let me tell you, she's a fighter. Her young son, Shaney, has cancer and needs the best care possible. And you know, she doesn't have any money to jump the queue. In fact, she contacted me when she was being booted from her house for lack of rent money. She worked at Rocky Mountaineer, the train, for 22 years. When she phoned me, she'd been on locked out for about five months, trying to make ends, make, the, make, make, make it work on strike pay. You see, Brian Day doesn't care what happens to Shaney, because Shaney will never be a customer. Shaney is just a little boy, a small human being fighting a very big disease. But you see, in our world, Shaney gets the very best care he needs. In our world, Tina doesn't get punished for standing up for her rights. She doesn't have to pay for our health care. In our world, sisters and brothers, we'll have a government that has the guts to shut down the private health care clinics of Brian Day because they are breaking the law. In our world, there's no two-tiered health care. We face many battles. We'll win some and lose some. But ensuring every person has a right to health care is one we can't afford to lose. We will fight forever to defend that, universal health care. We will fight Brian Day's vision of the world until the last public clinic, the last, sorry, private clinic is shut down. And let me tell you, sisters and brothers, it doesn't matter what title comes after my name. You will always be my sisters and brothers and we will always be in that battle together. Thank you so much. Of course, we all know that every time you pick up the paper, the millionaires will tell us, we can't afford public health care. The cupboard's bare, there's no money. The real truth is we can't afford private clinics and tax cuts for the millionaires, right? That's the truth. You know, in 2001, 2001 when Gordon Campbell took over, health care in British Columbia spending was 235 bucks per person, per person above the national average. Today, as we sit here in this room today, and as you go to work, in those facilities to take care of British Columbians, the government's spending $164 less than the national average. Tell me why it is that British Columbians aren't worth at least the national average. Why our health care isn't as important as everybody else's in the country. The sky is falling, we hear, all the time. Here's a quote. I thought it was really good. Throne speech, 2007. Seven years after they started cutting. Insatiable demands for health care funding has gone past the tipping point. Left unchecked, these demands will see our public health care system reach the breaking point. Not in decades, but in a manner of years. Well, really what's insatiable is a never-ending demand by the wealthy to get more of the money we all collectively make. The Fraser Institute, the Taxpayers Federation, the Manning Institute, and they're joined on every right-wing party in the province and in the country saying the same thing. If you elect us, we will cut your taxes and give you better health care and education. 
We will cut your taxes and give you better health care and education, and we're going to hear it again and again and again. These are the same people running around the country crying public service workers and public sector workers have gold-plated pensions and wages far above the private sector. You know, it sounds like some intro to a horror movie, tipping over, balancing out, running out of time. But the real horror story is not hospitals crumbling or tipping over or a Godzilla hiding in some closet in the hospital eating taxpayers' dollars. The real horror story is what goes on when hospitals and healthcare facilities aren't funded properly and you have to make up for that. That's the horror story British Columbians are living and that's what we have to fight against. The sky is not falling for God's sakes. We spend less in the last budget. By 2016, we'll spend $1 billion less on health care as part of the GDP than we did uh, five years ago. We're not increasing spending in real ways. We're taking away and spending less on health care. Since 2001, when all those tax cuts came in, we've given away $7.7 .7 billion in tax cuts. I know you've all gone to Hawaii with your tax cut. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it over there. Those all-inclusives are pretty cool. But the fact is, we didn't get that money. We'll never get that money, but we're $7.7 .7 billion short if we just had the same tax system we had in place in 2001 as today. So don't tell me that we don't have enough money. So then the question is, where did all that money go if it didn't go to Hawaii in your holidays? The fact is it went to corporations and the corporate profits in this country and in this province. And in 91, corporate profits were $3 billion, or 4% of the gross domestic product. And today, they're going to be 31, million, uh, 31 billion, or 12.3%. That's where the money went. And you know, sisters and brothers, this is not a fight over bankers or anything like that. And I want to talk to you about the future now. Because we have been attacked for years and years. It's what they say every day, over and over again. It's inefficient. It doesn't work. We can't afford it, over and over again. And we need to get ourselves organized better to go back and attack them. Not just defend ourselves when they attack us. We need to start attacking them because they're fundamentally wrong. Their vision of this country will not work for most human beings, if not almost all human beings. Our job is about everybody being important, right? So we need to go and say that. And you know, there's two responses in this crisis oftentimes. In the labor movement, I've seen it. One is, let's just, we're in the trench. Let's just dig a deeper one. If we dig a deep enough one, they won't see us and we'll survive. The problem with that is usually it just means the boss has to use a little more dirt to throw it on top of you. The fact is the other response is that we actually don't dig deeper but we rise up out of our trenches, find our allies, and build a united front to go on and take on the right wing in the country. And that's the plan we have to have, because hiding won't work. And so when you look at the plan we're gonna debate at the convention, you'll debate it. It's a plan that puts all of the unions together in one motion forward, coordinating research, coordinating articulation of our, our vision for the world, uh, communications, all of the things we need to do to be there every day and go after them every day. Because we can't afford to lose this argument up here. And in order to do that, we've got to be on the playing field, we've got to be united. And imagine what it would be like if we were all going in the same direction on this fight. Because let me tell you, they are, and I have full faith that after we have that debate at our convention and a summit by the public sector in January, we will leave with a five-year plan to make sure every British Columbia knows that we can not only afford health care, we need health care for everybody, and we're in charge of doing that with a government that will do it. That has to be our goal. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the task we have to do here fairly quickly. That is, there's an election coming uh, with a guy named Harper. Yeah, I know. Yes, yeah, stop Harper. Very good. He is the most destructive prime minister we've had in our history. I know it sounds rhetorical, but it's true. And suddenly, he's going to have a surplus going into the election. A surplus based on the firing of 25,000 public sector workers and their pain and despair and unemployment. That's who paid for the surplus. Well, they gave tax cuts to the corporations. And you know what? Important fact. 2,500 of those people were fired from the tax collection department, right? And so you really think about this, you fire the people in charge of making sure people don't cheat on their taxes, 
And the fact is, a study just came out that said Canadians, wealthy Canadians, mind you, because they're the ones with the money to cheat with, I know, you all have private accounts in the Cayman Islands. I know that's what you do. But you know, $80 billion, let me say that loud and clear, $80 billion or half the national health care budget is being sent annually offshore to hide in offshore accounts in Canada. So when they say to us, we don't have enough money, we just got to say those people just have to pay their fair share. We hire the people in charge of collecting the taxes and make them follow the law. And we'll have lots of money for Canadians to have what we need. And over the years, people have said to me, oh, Jim, why are we involved in politics? What are we doing getting involved in elections? Why are we marching in the streets? Can't we just go to the bargaining table and do our job for our members? And there's a certain appeal to it, really. If it was that simple, you know, I could go home at 5 o'clock every day. But you know what, sisters and brothers, we all know that's really bullshit. It's true. It really is, you know. People say it, but it's not true. The fact is that we know that on one hand, the ballot box, on the other hand, the bargaining table, are equally important to the trade union. In fact, as important as water and air are to human beings. Because without dealing with both of those, we will never survive. We need to be connected. Our democracy is our tool. We have to do that. And what's at stake, we know. Governments that rip up contracts. Governments that fire workers. Governments that underfund health care and education. Governments that rip up rules that protect working people. Governments that give tax cuts to the wealthy. We know that Stephen Harper has done all of those things and will continue to do them. The most great example of I can have is Stephen Harper. You want one? Temporary foreign workers. Temporary foreign workers. All across the country, Stephen Harper changed all the rules to let employers bring in temporary foreign workers for such highly skilled jobs as working at McDonald's. You know, I have to admit, and I started off at McDonald's, a lot of people did. And let me ask you this, with a million people unemployed, Where's the trade and the skill shortage for low-paid jobs in this country? Why did Christina phone me up and tell me about the time that she got abused in her workplace in Nanaimo? After 22 years of working at McDonald's, she was told, you're no longer good enough to be a manager. So if you want to keep working there, you're going to have to go back to the cashier and take a $4 an hour pay cut. And why was that? Because they brought in temporary foreign workers and moved her out and finally she quit. And then she stood up. First I talked to her, I said, you've got to tell your story. She said, I can't, I've got a job down the street, I don't want to, you know. And then that young fellow over in Nanaimo said, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have any hours because they're bringing in temporary foreign workers. So I phoned her up and I said, hi, it's Jim Sinclair phoning. And she said, I was expecting this call. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, every once in a while, sister, your time just comes. She says, yeah, I know, it's okay you can tell them to come and talk to me. And she was part of that whole move that pushed the government back on this whole issue because Canadians started standing up for themselves and temporary foreign workers. Now let me be very clear, very, very clear, the labor movement could not be fuzzy about this at all. We have no problem with workers coming to this country and working in this country from other countries. In fact, most of us in this room are here because they got to do that. Most of us are here, though, because they didn't come as temporary foreign workers with second-class rights that came and could become citizens when they came to this country. That's what we stand for, <laughs> clearly. And you know, that's the bottom line for us, is that what we say is very simple. It shouldn't be those temporary foreign workers who should be sent packing. We say every temporary foreign worker in Canada today should be allowed to stay in Canada and bring their families. Who should be sent packing is Stephen Harper and his government that created the program where they can bring in cheap labor. That's who should be sent packing, for sure. So, doesn't happen by miracles, gotta tell you. We gotta do this together. The whole labor movement, every one of you has to be involved in the elections. We gotta go talk to our friends and neighbors about our country, about the things we love about this country the things that are being destroyed by this government, the infrastructure, the services, taking care of our veterans. Can you imagine a government that shut down the veterans offices across the country? Shame is right. No, if there was ever a government that needed to go, it's this one. But they're not going willingly. 
Scott Walker just got elected in Wisconsin. Scott Walker is the most right-wing anti-union governor in the United States. And he just got elected in Wisconsin again. So sisters and brothers, let's be clear. We're not giving Stephen Harper the same free ride that Scott Walker got. He's gone unemployed, period. That's our job. Okay. Um, a few more thoughts and then I'll leave you to get back to the serious business of the convention. The Federation for me has been my life for a long time and the labor movement has been it for 35 or 40 years. It's a kind of federation that I think we should all be proud of and I've been really proud to be part of. Um, during the last fed, fed election two years ago when there was a candidate running against me, one of the things I heard uh, being said, not by the candidate, but by somebody else, is that the Federation and Sinclair spent too much time worrying about Nicaraguan apple pickers. You know, when I thought about that, and really what that code, that was code for this. That was code for farm workers, late night workers working alone, minimum wage workers who have no one to represent them and no one to demand that they get treated fairly. And uh, it was code for all of those precarious employees out there that looked to the Federation for help, for support. And we've done that over the years. We said our Federation wasn't just for working people with a union card in their pocket. If we were going to survive, we had to be a Federation for everybody. And that's so important to us if we're going to survive. Today, farm workers are going to fields to work. Yeah, it's tough. It's a really tough job. None of us would want to do it, frankly. But we know they're going to work in vans that are a lot safer than they were seven years ago when those three women died in those vans. And they're safer not because suddenly the government woke up, because that had happened before and before and before. It was part of the tradition every three years some van killed a bunch of farm workers. But today they're not coffins with wheels going to work because we cracked down and made a stink and made 28 recommendations and demanded an inquest and did all of that work. And we still did it and we're still doing it today because everybody should go to work and be safe. That's the bottom line. The mushroom workers, same thing, five mushroom workers. That night of the accident, I went right to that farm that night. I said, somebody has to speak for these people. Two days later, along with Adrian Dix, we had a meeting with all the families. I still meet with those families five years later. We still meet together. We've been to inquests, and we're still demanding the WCB implement the recommendations, including seven from the Fed, which said, amongst other things, every farm worker that goes to work in a field in British Columbia should have two days of training before they step into the field in safety. We are going to win those. <laughs> Grant DePady. His family was amazing. Imagine losing your son. I just, sorry, that's just something that's not there in my brain. Losing your son. And then losing your son in such a terrible accident, completely avo avoidable. And you know, there again, the courage of working class people to stand up, those folks with us went after the government over this. We said it's wrong to work late at night with cash in the drawer and be completely exposed. Grant DePady got fired from his last job because he wouldn't pay the company cash for the, the, the gas and dash. One of the reasons he went out the door that night was because the last place he worked, they wanted him to pay for that. Totally illegal, but who says his rights are anywhere? So we won that fight. We went to hearing after hearing the Young Workers Committee. The DePadys were incredible, even though they lived the pain over and over again. They did it. And they changed the law. We changed the law. We changed the law until we had the best, and there's a lesson in all of this, we had the best law for late night workers in North America. It was really simple. Lock the door, put a door in and protect the worker or have at least two workers on so they at least they have protection from each other. That's what we did. <laughs> the employers went crazy. Oh my God, the sky will fall. We can't afford to pay for two workers. Max Milk, are you kidding? They can't afford that. 7-Eleven? Are you, you got to be joking. So they went and lobbied the government and then they put part three in. Part three was, if you don't do the above two, set up a video camera and have a buzzer that you can press. Bing, I'm being robbed and somebody might come in a half an hour. <laughs> so many people are doing the first two things and that's the good news. Some people are doing the third thing. Let me say, we will not rest until that third part is gone and every worker is safe late at night. That's our job. That is our job. And you know, when employers do things that kill workers and they're grossly negligent, our campaign is clear. 
Right now, the Crown gives get-out-of-jail cards free to employers. You can be as negligent as you want, and nothing will happen to you. Those people who own that van, they shut down their company, they opened up another one, and three weeks later, they were caught with an unsafe van again. They were fined $72,000 by, by the WCB. How much of that do you suppose they paid? None. They were told by the RCMP, the Crown was told, charged them with negligence leading to death. It was an unsafe van, it had bald tires, bad brakes, non-licensed property, fraudulent safety permit. Uh, the seats were nailed to the floor. Like, hello? What does negligence look like? And what was the charge that was brought? Endangering other drivers. A $2,500 fine. Let me just say that I hope that we can all come to a convention soon and celebrate the fact that the law is being imposed and when an employer, through their negligence, kills workers, then they will spend some time in jail where they belong. There they belong. I also want to say to you that when we had the teachers dispute and I showed up on the rainy day out there in, uh, in um, Surrey, that you know I knew that the HU would be there. I knew before I went. It was piss and rain and it was awful. But you know what? That's what the labor movement's about, is showing up when you're needed. And you guys show up when you're needed for other people. And that's really, really important. Because that's all we have at the end of the day, is each other. All the other stuff is interesting, but the bottom line is all of this is about each other, about this, the word solidarity we have with the people in this room, the people in your work sites, and with all working people. The teachers were on strike. They had a hell of a dispute. And what were they on strike for? They were on strike so our kids could have a better education, so working class kids could get a real education, because our kids, unlike the premiers, can't jump over to the private school when they feel like it, okay? We need the public education system to work and it has to work really, really well, and it doesn't. And when it doesn't work, it's kids who suffer. And lots of kids come from homes that don't actually work that well. They don't work that well, so when they get up in the morning, it's not functioning the way it should be. Poverty, despair, we have the highest child poverty rates now, great thing to celebrate, eh? And when that kid walks out of that house and goes down the street and goes to school, and if that doesn't work for them, then nothing in their life works. And that means we failed miserably as a society to make sure everybody has that chance we all talk about. And public education is that equalizer. It's that one that gives people hope. What do you all hope for your kids? What have you always hoped for? Hope for them to get a bloody education so they can get a good job and they can get paid fairly. And so you've always been there on all those picket lines and that's what the Fed's about. It's about solidarity and the labor movement's about solidarity. And you've been doing this and by the way, the first person that stood up from the Federation of Labor and talked to your convention was your member. Brother Black was the first president of the Federation of Labor, so you have this in your blood. You can't get out of this. <laughs> it's in your blood, okay? So I want to... I had this great idea to end with all this waving arms, but really I just want to end by saying I know that we have the most incredible thing that we can have, which is a labor movement that fights for each other. And that's all I've ever believed in. It's not much more complicated than that. And I know we're going to continue to go forward fighting for each other and taking care of each other, regardless of whether you have a union card in your pocket, you're a working person. So thank you so much for what you do every day. And thank you for your solidarity with me, personally. Thank you.